Morning Lake Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. I've got a great word about a stunning contrast. But before we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Can you do me a favor? Reach out to friends, family members, in-laws, outlaws, everyone you know. Send them a link to the service. Let's get as many people watching our online services as possible. In fact, here's a goal. Let's get to triple digits every single week from this week forward. There's a goal. All right. I'll see you on the other side of the meet and greet. You know, it's really difficult to capture with words the desperate situation that humanity is in. You know, go back to the Garden of Eden and Genesis chapter 3. And when Adam and Eve, uh, you know, took of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, you know, they, they disobeyed God. God said, don't mess with that tree. Don't touch that tree. Uh, stay away from it. Every other tree you may eat from, but not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so, so they disobeyed. Right. And, and so what happened? Well, the, you know, the likeness of God within Adam and Eve was stained and sullied and polluted. And then their relationship with God was, you know, ruined and, and actually dead. The Bible likens our state uh, in rebellion towards God as dead in our sins and trespasses. And then on top of that, you know, the relationship between other people uh, was warped. Again, you see Adam and Eve suddenly, now there's friction in their marriage, friction in their relationship, and then on and on and on with all the other people that you see in, in the book of Genesis, you know, and beyond. And, and then the relationship between humanity and creation uh, was, was compromised. You know, the Bible talks about the fact that the earth, suddenly there's a curse on the ground that when Adam would work the ground, you know, he would work it by the sweat of his brow and, and there'd be thorns and, and there'd be thistles, okay? And then, of course, the, the, just the, the souls of humanity are, are twisted and broken. And, and worst of all, you know, Adam and Eve committed a crime against the sovereign Lord of the universe, and they didn't have the means to repay th that, that, you know, that debt. It was unbelievable. So instead of life, they find death, um, and in defiance, they basically sever their lifeline to God. And so, so humanity is, is guilty of sedition against the sovereign, and they're utterly lost. But wait! It gets worse than that, right? And the king is angry at humanity. You know, this is very, very bad news. Uh, the Bible likens this in the book of Romans, in particular in chapter 1, to, you know, we incur God's wrath. Okay, this is very, very bad news. News and and you know the idea of of the wrath of God, the idea of 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 God's wrath being poured out uh, uh, upon humanity is like the most unimaginable bad news. And of course, that doesn't play very well in a modern society where we all think that we're all good and 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 there's really nothing wrong with us. And if we can just throw money at it, or if we can just change the environment, humanity can be good, or humanity can be redeemed in some way, shape, or form without a savior. But, but the Bible is very clear. Humanity is lost. Humanity is broken. Humanity is rebellious. Humanity has basically because of their crimes against God, not giving God his due, they incur his wrath, right? That's very, very bad news. And, and so the bottom line is this, is because of humanity's rebellion against God, God is against them. God is against us. And so as we approach the latter verses in Romans 8, in our study of the book of Romans, it's a stunning contrast. You know, on one end, we see humanity in rebellion towards God and, 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 and the fact that God is angry at us and, and the fact that we incur his wrath. And so God is not for us, God's against us. And then we come up against the gospel and we come up against what Jesus has done for us. And we come up against all of the incredible promises and the litany of blessings that the apostle Paul talks about in Romans chapter eight. And so, so basically this shines 
so brightly against the backdrop of gloom and despair and darkness that is man's uh, rebellion towards God. And so I'm really excited about this section of the scriptures this morning as we, as we look at it uh, in our online service because, again, Romans 8, if it's not, it, it is the high water mark of the book of Romans. But Romans 8, verses 31 to 39, is the high, high water mark of Romans 8. It's so powerful. And again, it's a stunning contrast against the wrath of God. And so let's read it here. Romans 8, 31 to 39. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with them graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a powerful, powerful section of scripture. We're going to talk about that this morning. Can we pray? Father, I thank you so much for the high watermark of the book of Romans and how all of the uh, theological um, discourse and all of the sustained argument that Paul is making about the gospel, it comes to an incredible crescendo here in this last section of the book of Romans uh, chapter eight. And so Father God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us as we look into your word. And it's in Jesus name we pray, amen. So let's talk about this briefly here, church, okay? So big ideas in this section of scripture. Lots of great ones, gotta settle on three at least, okay? The first is simply this, is that God is for us. So, so Paul says in, in verse 31 of Romans 8, what should we say in response to this? Okay, let's just stop right there. So you know, why is he saying that? In other words, what conclusion can we draw? Okay. Well, he's, he's at least drawing upon two big ideas that he's already been de developing uh, from Romans 1 to Romans chapter 8. Okay. And the first is, is this, about how God is going to glorify us. Okay. So he had just said in verse 30 of Romans 8, and those he predestined, he also called, and, and those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. So he's trying to say, listen, in response to the fact that God is going to glorify us. God is going to give us a resurrected body just like Jesus that'll never die, that'll never experience shame, that'll never experience sickness or, or death or disease or decay. In light of that, you know, we've got to do something about it, okay? But, but he's spanning two different contrasts as he's developing this point. So he says, what should we say in response to this? Well, first, response to what? the glory of God that's coming for God's people, okay? But also he's been giving or providing a sustained argument from Romans chapter one, verse 18 to the present. And what does he say in Romans 1, 18? It says this, it says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Okay, so what he's trying to say is, listen, this wrath, <laughs> that we've been under, the fact that God is against us. Well, guess what? In Christ, that wrath has been reversed. In Christ, <laughs> in other words, there is a glory coming to humanity that is you know, the exact opposite of the gloomy, dark, dreary, drab state that humanity was in without God, without hope, and without Christ. And so this leads to this second question in Romans 8, 31, and that's simply this. If God is for us, who can be against us? Some theologians say that that is a concise statement of the gospel. In other words, what Paul's trying to say is, listen, whereas God ha had been against humanity, against the human race, we were all under God's 
wrath in Christ that has completely been reversed and the glory of God is coming into our lives. And it's a powerful, powerful thing. And you know, what he's been developing in, in Romans 5 and 6 and 7 is the idea that humanity has been embroiled in a conflict. I mean, just, just Romans 5 verse 10 talks about the conflict between God and sinful humanity, right? We were at enmity. We were not friends, right? We were enemies, right? And, and then you go to Romans 6 and it talks about the conflict between life and death, between sin and righteousness. And then you fast forward to Romans 7 verse 21 and Paul talks about the conflict between the flesh and the will to please God. And then finally in Romans 8 verse 5, he talks about the conflict between the flesh and the spirit. So there's been this turmoil going on between God and humanity. But in Christ, all of that has been nullified. In Christ, all of that has been rectified. And, and so, so there's, a conf, there's a contrast here. And Paul's trying to say, listen, in response to what we once were, to what God says we are and will become, right? If God is for us, who can be against us? It is so, so powerful. And, and the second point that Paul develops here in verse 32 of Romans 8 is that God will give us all things. It says this, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? And so Paul is trying to make an argument, you know, from, from the greater to the, to the lesser. And this idea that, listen, God has already sent his son. God already gave us his son. And, and because he did that, in other words, the demonstration of how much he loved us is he sent his son to die as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. If that doesn't demonstrate that God is for us, if that doesn't demonstrate how God loves us, I don't know what does. But he says, listen, because of that, because of that, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Okay, so what are these all things that Paul is talking about? And I believe he's, he's reflecting, or he's referring to rather, Romans 8, verses 35 to 39. Again, let me read it. He's talking about, listen, if, if God has already given us his son, how much more will he also give us all things? Well, what type of things? Well, the idea that the love of Christ it will, will, will you know, persevere through trouble and hardship and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and sword, right? In other words, this idea that in all these things, we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Neither height, depth, angels, demons, the present, the future, nor any powers, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so when he's talking about these all things, he's saying, listen, any opposition, uh, any persecution, anything that comes against us is not greater than God's love for us in Christ. And he will turn all of that around in our lives. In other words, all of these enemies are actually going to be turned around for the good for God's people. In other words, Romans 8, 37, in all these things we are more than conquerors, is exactly a parallel to Romans 8, 28, right? God causes all things to work together for the good of those that love him, to those that are called according to his purpose. In other words, the love of Christ is so powerful that God can take our enemies and turn them around to be our friends. They're going to be for our good. It's fat, it, it just, it's phenomenal. In other words, <laughs> I've said this before, I'll say it again. If you really get what Paul is talking about here in Romans 8, you'll never be depressed another day in your life. You'll never be under the weather or under the circumstances another day in your life because you realize, listen, there's nothing that faces you in your humanity that God has already made provision for in Christ and he's gonna turn all that around for your good. But, but it's even more than that, okay? In other words, what are all these things that he's going to give us? He's gonna turn our enemies around to become our friends. All of the enemies of the human race are gonna be turned around, the scripture says, in Romans 8, 35 to 39. But also, Paul has been developing this argument, particularly in Romans 8, 19 to the present, that God is going to give us the entire created order restored. In fact, he's gonna give us the universe 
restored. Look at what it says in Romans 8, 21. It says, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. In, in other words, this God graciously giving us all things refers to God's gift of a restored universe to his people. I'm telling you, this is stuff worthy. You should be shouting about this stuff. Think about that. Your enemies turned around to be your friends and the entire recreated, restored universe is being given back to humanity. Let's remember, we were once his enemies. Now we're his friends because of what Christ has done for us and he's lavishing Un, you know, indescribable blessings upon his people. And then finally, Paul develops this in Romans 8, 33, that we stand free of all charges against us. He says this in Romans 8, 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, and more than that, he was raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and he's also interceding for us. So so I got obviously these idea this idea of bringing charges is a legal term, right? Is is that you know the idea that listen, you know, the enemy of our soul Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. Look at Romans chapter or I'm sorry, Revelation rather, chapter 12 verse 10. All the prosecution, every person that has ever laid a charge against you or I, every demonic onslaught that has ever laid a charge against you or I. It says, listen, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who can bring any charge against us? And theologians will tell us that Paul most likely here is alluding to Isaiah, the 50th chapter, verses eight through nine, which says this, he who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the sovereign Lord who helps me. Who is he that condemns me? And so the idea that we are justified as if we had never sinned, we stand not guilty before God. There's no condemnation. And we've already developed this and it already talks about this in Romans 8, 29 to 30, this idea that, listen, not only are we not only justified, but we are made, we are adopted and brought into the family of God. In other words, it's one thing to be acquitted by the judge. It's quite another thing to be adopted by the judge, brought into his family, where you become the beneficiary and the recipient of unbelievable blessings. That's what God has done for us in Christ. And it goes on to say in verse 34 that, listen, Christ, he, he was raised to life, right? The resurrection of Jesus. But not only has he been raised to life, but he is at the right hand of God interceding for us. And so Paul is alluding here to Psalm 110, verse 1, where it talks about the idea that, that, that um, Christ has won the victory over his enemies and he's taken a seat at God's right hand, which is incredible. That is so powerful and so dynamic. But the high point that Paul is emphasizing here is not so much Christ's position, but that the use of his position is for the benefit of God's people. He intercedes for us. Again, that's a judicial phrase. It carries with it the idea of someone within the king's court related close enough to the king or friends enough with the king that they slip in as that king is, is maybe uh, adjudicating a particular case and basically make an appeal to the king on someone's behalf. That is what Jesus is doing for us all the time. In other words, if God's for us, who can be against us? It doesn't matter what you're facing in the form of sickness, in the form of struggles, in the form of relational issues, in the form of financial issues. Jesus is at the right hand of God. He's making petitions for you before the King, before God the Father to take care of you. In other words, Jesus uses his kingly position, not exclusively for himself, but for his people. That is so powerful. And that same idea is in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 to 22. Let's read this here. It says, he, the power that he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but in the, age, the one to come, God has placed all all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything, wait for it, for the church. Jesus is head 
over everything. Why? For the purpose of the church, for the purpose of his body, for the purpose of extending his kingdom through the people of God, his church, on this earth, in this age. That is so, so powerful. Again, time doesn't permit me to hit this stuff as deeply as I should, but this is, this is material <laughs> from God's word. This is revelation from his scriptures that we should meditate on and get into our spirit in the midst of any and all trials that we face because it will put you know this will put steel in our spine and give us strength and give us incredible resolve so the stunning contrast is this god was against us god was totally against us is that we incurred his wrath because our rebellion but now he's for us to the nth degree <laughs> he is for us for all of eternity and all of the authority of heaven is behind us and with us and for us. And that should, again, that should give us all encouragement and propulsion through whatever we're facing in this moment. This should give us forward momentum for anything. But again, because again, the litany of things that Paul says have been disarmed because of Christ are, are, are just incredible. Death, life, angels, demons, present, future, powers, height, depth, anything else in all creation, that pretty much covers it, right? None of that, none of that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I tell you what, if this wasn't so much a recorded service right now, I'd really start shouting because this is powerful, powerful stuff that gives us steel and our spine. And I pray that, I pray that God would get this into your spirit right now. I speak that over every person that's watching this. That, that, that the revelation and the depth, the enormity uh, of this that Paul is declaring of how, how much God is for us and not against us gets into our spirit and gives us strength. Can we pray? Father, I thank you so much for your word tonight. And Father God, I pray that God, your hand would be upon every single person. God, let this idea that neither height nor depth, nor angels, nor demons, nor life, nor death, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. God, let that get into our hearts, our minds, our spirits. And Father God, let that give momentum to every single person here to face whatever they're facing. And Father, I thank you for it. And I bless the people of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, it was great to be with you uh, today. And uh, until next week, I call you blessed. Take care.